Well, we have been in, in, a, in a series um, of messages called um, I Heart My Church. And I love my church, and I love, I love the church. I don't just love my church. I love any church. I love pastors. I, I, I'm privileged to talk to pastors, to try to help pastors anytime I can. Um, I just love, I love, I love the church. And uh, no, it's not perfect. And we said that just about every week because I think sometimes people are like, well, this, this is bad or this hurt my feelings or hey, li- listen, I, it's not going to be perfect. I'm not going to be perfect. I, I told someone again this week, I said, hey, being a senior pastor is just about letting people down at a rate they can stand. You know, because, you know, your expectations, sometimes it's hard to re- live up to everyone's expectations and you're just trying your best. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, I'm just human and you're just human and we're all jacked up. We're all screwed up. We all have issues. Right. But yet when, when, when God gets involved, he takes he takes just the, the, the craziness of this world to confound the wise is what, what 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 the Bible says, that he will use anybody, anyone, anywhere who will just say, hey, I'm available. I love God. I love people. I've got my issues, but I believe believe God can use me. And that's, that's what we've been talking about. We love the church because it brings hope and it brings power and it brings the love of God to the world as messed up as it is. Right. And so, and so if we'll just keep in mind, we're messed up, but we serve a perfect God who wants to perfect us by his grace, who has perfected us by his spirit and wants to do a perfect work through us. If we can just say, Hey, we'll just keep that in focus then God can do amazing things through all of us. And so we've been talking about that. And I want to continue this week really where I left off last week. And so last week we talked about, we've been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. And we've been talking about how the Holy Spirit works in and through our lives and how he brings power and how it's the power of God through us that, that touches the world, that it's God through us, God through us that touches the world. So we've been talking about this. And last week uh, we talked about you have to go with the overflow. Do you guys remember this? Well, you got to go with the overflow. And we said the secret to going with the overflow is you got to overflow before you go. Like, if you want to go with the overflow, you got to overflow before you go. And so I, I want to continue in that, that same vein today. In fact, it's just, I'm just tagging on to, to, to last weekend, really. And so I want you to turn with me again to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And, uh, and I, I gave you a lot of context for John chapter 7, but just in case you missed it, I'm going to give you a little bit more. I'm not going to give you the same information, but, but John chapter 7 is, is what, what's going on. Well, what's going on is, is it's one of the major feasts of, um, of, of Israel, of, 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 of Jews, for Jews. Uh, it's a mandatory, and it's a pilgrimage, and it's mandatory, meaning, meaning the heads of the house have to go to Jerusalem. You have to participate. I just want you to think about the God that we serve is so cool. He, man, he mandates that you party. Like, I don't know if you've thought about that because some people are like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, if, if I get saved, I have to give up all the party. No, 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 you get to party more. Like when Jesus comes back, we get a seven-year party. Zachariah says the Feast of Tabernacles, which we're about to talk about, we celebrate it every year for a thousand years. He's mandating we keep partying. Psalm 91 said he'll show you your salvation. If you look at the message translation, it said then he'll throw you apart. And so here's the thing. No, with Jesus, you, you party all the time. He's a party animal. It's just you get to party without the regret. You get to party without wondering what you sent on Snapchat. You got to party without wondering what you posted on your Insta story. You get to party without a hangover. It's a great, ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. Because a Holy Ghost party won't stop. Come on, somebody. You better help me preach. <laughs> And so, so he, how cool is that? Like, he, God's a party animal. Sometimes we miss that. Maybe we got the wrong definition of what a party is, but I'm just telling you, he's a partying kind of God. And so there are seven feasts, three major feasts. The three major feasts were mandated pilgrimage feasts, and so that would have been Passover, Pentecost, and, and Tabernacles. And so Tabernacles, according to one of the historians of the day, Josephus, Tabernacles was, was like the favored uh, festival or, or celebration of, of the Jews because it was just, it was so much fun. They also called it a feast of booths because they would, they, they were, it, it, the whole idea was, was about remembering God's faithfulness through the wilderness, right? Remembering. And so they did things like they created booths and they moved out of their houses and camped out. 
And, and they did that to remember how, how God brought them through, through the, and they lit candles about how this, this pillar of fire led them and they had parades, right? And it was all, it was all a reminder of God's faithfulness. And, and the, reason, the reason that we need to be intentional, I don't know if you've ever thought of this, you need to be intentional about remembering how faithful God has been because forgetfulness is the enemy of faith. And when we start forgetting how good God has been to us, we'll start wondering if God's going to move in our life. But, but, but when we remember the faithfulness of God and we remember what God has done, right? And we remember how God has moved and how God has redeemed and how God has brought us through, then it is a testimony of what God's going to do in, in the future. See, the enemy wants you focused on what you don't think God God has done yet when God wants you focused on what he has already done because what he has already done is a testimony of what he's going to do in the future and if I'm wondering if God's going to come through if I'm wondering if God is going to redeem if I'm wondering if God is going to deliver I don't need to wonder I just need to look at the altars of my life where God has already come through he has already redeemed he has already transformed he has already healed he has already and, and that tells me if he did it then he'll do it again right this is what David said when faced with the biggest challenge of his life, a mean old nasty, ugly, stinky giant. And David said this. They said, how do you feel about it, Dave? He said, you know, I was thinking, I remember there was a bear and there was a lion. And that tells me what's about to happen to this giant. I just wonder if you're facing something today. Maybe you could remind what you're facing of, of what you've already faced. In fact, maybe you need to remind yourself of what you've already faced so that you would have some strength to step into what God is calling you to next. Amen. That's good preaching right there. I, I feel a lot better than when I came in. Let's just stand and pray. We're not even going to preach the message. That was so good. I'm just kidding. But... Man, the, the Bible said David, David would, he would strengthen himself in the Lord, strengthen himself in the Lord. In, in my opinion, there were two things that David did, is that David would constantly review or, or remember um, the testimony of the Lord, what God had done, and the prophecy of the Lord, what God has said about what is to come. And I'm just telling you, in, in your life, if you ever need to be, if you ever need to be strengthened in the Lord, if you'll start looking at what God has done and what God has said, you will find strength to face whatever you are facing. Are, are, are you with me? And so, and so that, th th so anyways, back to the story. So this was all about remembering, if you will, remembering um, the, the faithfulness, the faithfulness of God. And, and so we know that every day it was, it was a seven day feast plus one. God, God gave it seven days and then added an eighth day, which was a day of convocation. And, and so we know that, 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 that every day a priest would go down to the pool of Siloam and get water and come back and dump it on the altar. And on, on the last day of the feast, he would come back to the altar and he would circle it seven times. Um, and that was, that was reminiscent again of how God had delivered Jericho into the hands of the Israelites, because that is what ended, if you will, the wilderness season. They were now in the promised land. And so the Bible says that, that before he would pour the water out, or, or he would circle seven times, and then he would pour the water out, and, and then they would blast the shofars, and the people said, with joy, he'll satisfy us with the wells of salvation. With joy, you satisfy us with the wells of sal salvation. And, and, and so we know that he went to pour that out, and it gets quiet. The hush fall, because they know what's coming. They're waiting on the shofar blast. And that's where we get to John 7, 37, because I think when it was quiet, that's when this verse takes place on the last and greatest day of the feast. It says, Jesus stood and said, cried out like a raven. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Got to go with the overflow. Got to overflow before you go. Verse 39, but, but this he meant of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up until that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. I want to talk to you just a few moments, and here's, here's, my, here's my subject, my title, if you will. Just add water. Can we pray? Father, thank you so much for your grace and your goodness and your love. And God, we have gathered today, not in a building, we have gathered in your presence. 
We didn't enter into a building. We did. But, but we entered the building because our hearts were set to enter into your presence, to hear from you, to encounter you. Let this not be a religious meeting, a church service. But God, let this be a divine moment where your Holy Spirit speaks. And God, where your, where your, where your love and grace and power transforms us. And God, let us leave here changed, knowing, knowing you more and knowing more about, God, our purpose and what you called us to. Let, let us not leave this place the same way we, let God, let us just set our hearts, God, to, to quiet our souls, to quiet our cell phones, to quiet everything around us and just say, God, we, we want a moment with you where you speak and you change and you transform and then you lead us out of this place into all that you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, so just add water. So I've got some, some things. This is pretty cool. It's like a, a, a box of goodies, right? And so, so these, are, these are all cool things. They, they all seem to have one, th one thing in common, though. Um, like when, when we look, like this is pan pancake. Pancake. And, and how many like pancakes? Like I'm, I've got a 12-year-old that can eat his weight in pancakes and waffles. And it's pancake. It's light and fluffy because there's no other way, really. Light and fluffy. Because, I mean, I don't know what the opposite. That'd be like, well, that'd be, I guess, heavy and dense. I don't know what, what the opposite is. Anyways, obviously, if you're going to have pancakes, you want them light and fluffy. And, and it's a complete buttermilk mix. All you got to do is add water and top with, with, with your tasty syrup. And, and so, so there's some powder, but, I mean, it's, it's good, but it's really hard to eat that way. And then, then here's this, Hawaiian punch, essentially Kool-Aid. Um, this is how I survived junior high, because I got a Hawaiian punch every day. I stayed, like, jacked up on Hawaiian punch. But um, this is sugar-free, because apparently Maria thinks that I shouldn't have sugar. And so um, <laughs> I don't know what the point is anymore once it's sugar-free. Like, But anyways, it's, you know, it's powder, powder. And here's some green tea. Anybody like green tea? You like green tea? Green tea is really good, too. Green tea is full of antioxidants, right? It's like really, Jono green tea is like one of the most healthy things you can, like not if you put a lot of sugar in it, but like it's one of the most healthy things you can actually take. And so if you just put it in, it tastes so good. And I feel, I feel the antioxidants just flooding my body right now. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm getting healthier right now. I'm so good. Love it so much. Love green. I love green tea, actually. I don't usually have it like this. But, uh, I don't usually have it like that. But, um, but no, no, it doesn't work that way. Because, because the reality is, for us, for us to see what any of these things are actually going to become, then, then we actually have to add water to them, right? We have to add water. So I got some other cool things in here, too. What do I got? Oh, yeah, this would be cool. Oh yeah. Oh, where did that go? Yeah, we'll do this one. Yeah, this is pretty cool. Yeah, these these are these are little creatures that grow. Yeah, I'm pretty. Hang on a second. So I'm pretty. Where'd you go? I'm pretty excited. Oh man. Oh, awesome. Yeah, here we go. So so this one. This one is is a is a ray. Like it's, I guess I don't see a stinger. So maybe not a stingray. I think that's what that is. So we're going to put him in here. Yeah, that's, that can be Ray from Finding Nemo. <laughs> anyways, Disney fans, where are you? But anyways, and don't send me a letter. Oh, we shouldn't support Disney. I don't care. And so what happens is, is that we got we to gotta put water. If we want to see what this guy's really going to become, we have to, we have to add water. Because according to the package, check this out. According to the package, he's going to grow 600 times Six will he even fit in there anymore. I don't know. I don't know. We'll find out together, won't we? I may want to find out what Ray's going to become. You can do it, buddy. Grow, grow, grow. Drink, 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 drink the water. So awesome, right? But here's the truth, though. None of these things can be what they're designed to be without water. That's pretty much what Jesus is telling us here. In fact, you want to write these things down. Four points today. We're going to cover four points, still get out on time, because I'm going to prove to you miracles happen. <laughs> but the first point is this. Jesus came to bring water to us. Because Jesus knows what I just told you, that if I want to find out who these people, and he actually knows, he's, he's the author of our lives, but for us to find out who we can be, 
for us to find out what we were created to be, just like pancakes. I mean, nobody eats powder, but you throw a little water in there. And if you're like me, a little peanut butter and some vanilla and a little bit of oatmeal. I know you, you don't understand what I'm capable of when you put me in a kitchen, but I follow no recipes because I'm, I'm a creative I figure that out. I'm very creative. And so I just make up my own stuff. But for, for us to find out or for any of these things to become what they were intended to be, that you have to add water. And that's kind of what Jesus does. He stands up. Now think about this. Think about this. He stands up and, and here's what he says. Verse 37, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Now, now he had an assumption that, that the people around him were not satisfied. It's interesting because he's around religious people. It's interesting because John 4, he offers water to, to the woman at the well, a Samaritan, not a Jew, Samaritan. Maybe not raised in church. I mean, who, who knows what her story is? We know she had some idea uh, or, or some ideas or some understanding of religion. But now he's, he's talking to believers who have gathered to celebrate the faithfulness of God. And he says, hey, you know what? You may still be thirsty. Because you can't do anything on the outside to quench the thirst that you have on the inside. And it doesn't matter whether that's good, because remember the tree that, that, that cost, the, the tree that caused the fall of man, remember, was a tree that had good knowledge and evil knowledge. And you can die from eating either. Like, do all the good you want, it doesn't make you alive. Do all the evil you want, it still won't make you feel alive. Are you with me? And so, and, so, and so here's his message. Whether you're a believer or you're an unbeliever, right? Whether you're doing good stuff or whether you're doing evil stuff, it doesn't matter. There's still only one water that's going to satisfy. Like do all you want on the outside. You can do bad. I did bad all by myself. You can do bad on the outside, right? You can do good on the outside. And nothing you can do on the outside can change the thirst on the inside. And for that reason, Jesus stands up and he says, hey, your church going won't do it. Hey, your Bible study, that won't do it. Those are good things, but that's not what does it. I'm the only one that does it. And then he goes, hey, it doesn't matter how many Twitter followers you have, what's going on in your Instagram story, how many times you swipe right on Tinder, how many times you shut down the bar. It doesn't matter how much of that you do because nothing Nothing you're going to do on the outside is going to change the thirst that you have on the inside. Right? Proverbs 20, 27 um, says this. It says, just as death and destruction are never satisfied. Look at this. Look at this. So human desire is never satisfied. Like here is, the, here is the brokenness. We all have a thirst that we cannot quench. Try. Try anything you want. Try anything you want. You have a thirst that you can't quench. It can't be quenched with, with prestige or promotion. It can't be quenched with money. It can't be quenched with relationships. You have a thirst. We all have a thirst that cannot be quenched. This is why Jesus came. Jesus came because everybody was thirsty. Like there's a phrase now called thirsty. And if you look at someone's Instagram pro post, and maybe it's just a little bit too revealing, or someone is presenting themselves in cert certain ways or pursuing certain things, you might look at them and say, that person is thirsty. That means they, they're trying to satisfy themselves by drinking from something that could never satisfy, whether it's, it's the illusion of love and acceptance or, or whether it's actually a substance. It doesn't matter because Jesus said this, hey, everybody's thirsty, but there's one well that satisfies. He said this, now, now how do I know? Well, I could ask if I wanted to, I could call a witness today of the wisest man that had ever lived. And I could ask him, is there anything else that will satisfy? And you know what he told us? Because he wouldn't just tell us, he's already told us. He would tell us, no. I'm talking about Solomon. The wisest, wisest man. Think about this. Wisest man. He had all the wine. He had all the women. He slept with over a thousand women, had a thousand wives, which is kind of a mark against, is he really wise? I'm just, I'm not, nothing, I'm not saying anything bad about females. It would be not wise the other way either. I'm just saying he had, brother had a weakness. That's all I'm saying. But anyways, he was the wisest man who ever lived. And he had all the power and all the prestige and all the gold, probably the wealthiest man that ever lived. He had everything that you could imagine at, at his this private jets, private islands. I mean, the, the guy had it all, right? 
And if we ask Solomon, okay, what, 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 at, at the end of that, what, did, what was your conclusion? It's great because he gave us this book called Ecclesiastes, where at the end of that, he gives us his conclusion. And he starts out this way, vanity, vanity, vanity. Another way to say that is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Like what he said, here's my conclusion. It's all meaningless. In fact, he ends Ecclesiastes by saying this um, in chapter 12 of verse 13. He says, when all has been heard, here is the end of the matter. So you can, listen, you can try. Here's what I think is wise, learning from somebody else's mistake. But if you want to have your own, go ahead. Right? How many think it's wise to learn from somebody else? So here he is. He's tried it all. He's tried stuff we can't afford to try. Are you with me? And he said, he said here, here's, here's the conclusion. When all's been heard, the end of the matter is fear God. Worship him with all filled reverence, knowing that he is almighty God. And keep his commandments. Look at this. For this applies to every person. Here's what he said. At the end of everything, at the end of everything, here's the only thing that matters. God. Serving God, worshiping God, knowing God. I think Jesus said it this way. This is life that you'd know the one true God and Jesus Christ who is he sent. Like, like this is life. Like if you're sitting here like, man, I just don't know the meaning. I just don't know. Maybe, maybe I could find it in this. Maybe I could try this. And hey, Let me help you. Let me help you. Jesus said, come to the water and drink. Like we're, everybody's thirsty, but we have to, we have to come to, to the water and drink. There, there's only one water that satisfies, right? And so Jesus stands up on this last and greatest day of the feast, and he said, hey, I've come to bring water to you. But he didn't stop there. Here's the second thing. Jesus came to direct water through you. Like he came to bring water to us, but he came so water could flow through us. It's, it's two parts, right? To the woman of the well, he said, if you're thirsty, I can give you living water. To the people that day, he said, hey, hey, if you're thirsty today, I can give you living water. But then he backs up and he says this in verse 38 after that, because in verse 38, he said, whoever believes, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. In other words, now we have two things going on that, that he steps up and he says, you know what, you know what, you know what? I came to bring water to you, but you know what else? There's a day coming when water can flow through you. Because it said he said this, meaning the Holy Spirit. In other words, he is pointing to the fulfillment of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, right? And Acts chapter 2 is when the Holy Spirit was poured out on, 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 on all flesh, but specifically on the church. They flames of fire and all this wind and all this other stuff, right? And so Jesus is backed up, and here's what he's saying. He's like, hey, today you can drink, but, but, but today water can come to you. But, but my real goal here is so that water will flow through you. I want you to hear what I said. Like, like Jesus said, hey, water can come to you. It can quench your thirst. But here's what I'm really after. Not just water coming to you. I'm after water flowing. I'm after water flowing through you. That, that's why when his disciples said, Jesus, don't leave. Jesus, don't leave. Because he said, I got to go away. And they're like, no, 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 don't go. Don't go, Jesus. Don't go, Jesus. Don't. He said, no, no, no. He said, it's better if I go. Here's what he meant by that. If I don't go, the rivers can't flow. It's better that I go so that the rivers can flow through you. If I don't go, see, I'm limited. I can only be in one place. I can only stand up at one feast at a time and say, hey, guess what? I'm the river. I'm the water. Here's the living water. This is what you're, this is what you're thirsty for and you don't even know it. And so I'm here. Here, Come on, come on, come on. Come all who, who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. I mean, you can only do that. But he said, you know what? You know what? If I go, I can send the Holy Spirit so that the river will flow through all those who believe. So that anyone who's a believer, and that's what we've been talking about is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what last week was about. You got to go with the overflow. So you got to overflow before you go that, that we need something to offer the world, even if, if we're going in the world. So before we go into the world, we need something to offer. So we got to, we got to, come on, somebody. It's like George Strait. We got to carry his love with us. I'm carrying your love with me. Anyways. King George, everybody. And so, and so we got to have something. And so here's what he said. I've come to give you power. What is this power? It's like, it's, like it's, it's, it's water. It's the water that flows out of us so that we can take God's love and God's grace and God's mercy and God's power to other people who, who are thirsty. I, I, don't, I don't know if you realize this, but Jesus didn't come to reach the world. Jesus came to reach the church. So the church could reach the world. Let me back up and say something there. Jesus didn't come to reach the pastor so the pastor could reach the world. 
Jesus didn't even come to reach the evangelist. So the evangelist, right? Je- Jesus, Jesus came to reach the church. Not, not just a few, but, but the whole church. He said, all those who believe rivers can flow out of. I'm not asking you if you're called to be a pastor or an evangelist or a teacher or a prophet or apostle or or something like that. I'm not asking you if you feel like you're called to vocational ministry or not. I'm just asking if you're a believer. Are you a believer? Because if you're a believer, then Jesus had a goal. And that goal was that living water would flow through your life. That love would flow through your life. That his grace and his mercy and his peace and his power would flow through your life. That was his plan. That that, that this river that, that we drank of would become uh, uh, this water we drank of would become a river that flowed out of us continually to those around us. He came to reach the church so that the church could reach the world. And I'm afraid of a couple of things. I think sometimes in church we think, oh, yeah, our responsibility is to show up at church. The pastor's responsibility is to reach the world. And right now I wanted to, I wanted, you know, <laughs> McFly, you know, I, mean, it's, I don't know why, but ADD. But anyways, um, but, but that's not what the Bible tells us. When you look, it says go into all the world. It, it doesn't say pastors go into all the world. In fact, Ephesians 4 tells us this, that, that the goal that my job here is not to reach the world. My job is to convince you it's your job to reach the world. He said he gave some, uh, and, and he lists the, the pastors and the teachers, and he said, what, to, to, to develop, encourage, empower, and equip believers to go reach the people around them, right? So if we're really doing church, it's not really church till ministry happens outside of this church, right? This is half of it. We got this part down. We came. We worshiped. Now I'm screaming like a lunatic, right? Because I'm trying to inspire, I guess. I don't know. But we got this half down. Like we have gathered. But now we drink deep so we can go out and the rivers can flow into the streets. Are you, are you with me? Like This, this was his plan. It's, it's, I came to reach the church. On this rock, I will build my church. Jesus is the cornerstone to build the church. The church has a responsibility to reach the world. This was his plan, that, ri- that the same river we drank of w- would, would flow, flow out of us. See, I- I'm concerned sometimes in, in church that-, that we think our only job is to get saved and then to attend church when we can. And, and I think religion, is, this is why I'm such an enemy of religion, and that may freak you out, but religion will, will help you have a saved soul and a wasted life because religion will teach you, Oh, you're, you're really only your job here was to get saved. So you didn't burn in hell and show up at church whenever it was convenient. Right. And, and that, that's religion. And that doesn't work because that doesn't do the mission of Jesus. Jesus was very not religious. He was non-religious. Right. And think if they would have said, what is your religious affiliation? He would have said none. Right, but, and, the, and the only people that didn't like him, by the way, were the religious people. You know why? Because Jesus was always doing ministry in strange places at strange times. Right? Like he would go do ministry throughout the week and cast out demons and all types of stuff. And they're like, oh, this would cause a hubbub. And he'd heal this person. And that'd be a man born blind. Got to heal him. Oh, no, it's, it's, you shouldn't have healed this guy. Why were you healing this guy? Oh, you can't heal. on. Then, then he'd go to church and he'd heal people on Sunday. They'd get mad because he healed people on Sunday. You're not supposed to work on Sunday, they'd say. It's a commandment. Or, you know, keep, the, keep the Sabbath and keep it holy. And it's unholy to, to do a miracle. <laughs> Here's the thing. If we're not careful, religion will teach us that our responsibility is to be saved and attend worship service whenever we can and, and, and wait on Jesus to come back. And then here, here's my concern is we could be guilty of having a saved soul, but a wasted life because God has so much more for us. He wants to empower us by his spirit. He wants you. Listen, think about it this way. Like his only plan to reach the world was the church. God doesn't have a plan B to reach the people around you. He doesn't have a plan B to reach this world. That that Jesus said, this world needs water, so here's what I'll do. I'll create rivers that can move around. Like, I don't know if you know this, but, but most of the rivers on your map have stayed on your map. They have been there a long time. 
We don't have to worry about the Sabine getting up today and coming to church and drowning us all, right? We don't, don't have to worry about that. It's still over there. The Red River's still where it's at, right? The, the Mississippi's staying right over there where it's at, right? Are, are you with me? The, the rivers don't typically move, but Jesus is like, you know what? I've got this great plan. I will quench the thirst of your soul and then make you a river that moves around to other thirsty people so that the living water can flow through your life to them. Like, this is the plan. And I know some of you, well, I'm not qualified. It's okay, I'm not either. Can I just tell you that, that based on most hiring practices of churches, Jesus couldn't get an interview? He's not married, right? Because we want, we want our, 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 our pastors married. And, and I, got, I got let go from a position one time because I wasn't married, even though they hired me knowing I was single. I'm like, of all the reasons to let somebody go, but there's politics involved. It doesn't really matter. But anyways, you get a single, got to have, you know, at least a four-year degree, if not a master's degree. Master of Divinity would be the best thing that you could have. And I mean, you got to have all this ministry experience. You got to be able to, and so if Jesus would have showed up and said, hey, if you want to interview, who are you? I'm a carpenter from Nazareth. Oh, bro, man, you should have made the interview. How did you even get to the first round? Like, we should have let you know already. So here's what I'm saying. If you're not qualified, great, you're in great company. Jesus was a fisherman. Matthew was a tax collector. Jesus was a carpenter. Paul was a tent maker, right? Are you with me? That's okay. In fact, if you don't feel like you're qualified, that's the proof you're qualified. Because here's the thing about this river. The river will empower you. The river will empower you. This, this, this ray here, ray is going to grow to be 600 times bigger just because he's in the river. Are you with me? And so, so we, we got to get the river to people. And so we're, we're launching something today. And so I want to introduce Jason Morris. Jason, will you stand? Jason's a great friend and, and, and an owner. Yeah, you give him a hand. You're like, I don't know him. I'll tell you why you're clapping in a minute. But, but Jason and Tara are great friends and have known Pastor Mark a long time. And I've gotten to know them as they've become a part of Pathway. But they have such a heart and desire for outreach. And I said, hey, I'm looking for somebody that can coordinate outreach for us and make sure that they're, they're liaison to all the ministries that we are connected to, to know what the needs are and what's going on. Because we have been very faithful in giving, but we want to be faithful in going. Are you with me? And, and uh, so many people in our church want to be a part of outreach and are a part of outreach. And I said, hey, we got and, and nothing against going, you know, but but I want to go consistently and, and I want to, and, and I want to have, you know, outreaches going all the time and, and whether here in Longview or around the world. And so we've been putting some stuff together. And so today we're launching that out. And if you want to be a part, we have an outreach coming up at the end of the month. If you want to be a part of that, you can stop by and see Jason in the lobby today. He'll give you all the information. If you want to go on an international trip, he'll give you all the information uh, and he'll connect with you. Um, but, but I'm excited because this is what we're doing. We're saying, Hey, we're going to take the river, right? Come on, King George, we're carrying your love with us. You know, we're going with it, right? We're going to take the river wherever we go. Are, are you with me? Here's the third thing that, that I want to say is that thirst is constant. So drinking must be consistent. Thirst is constant. So drinking must be consistent. Ephesians 5, 18. Um, this is what Paul said to the Ephesians. He said, he said, don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, right? Or debauchery or wildness, whatever. Um, <laughs> which is bad Instagram post, um, but, but be filled. Look at this. Be filled with the Spirit. You know what I love about that verb tense, be filled? It is present, perfect, progressive. Meaning what Paul was saying is don't be drunk with wine, but be filled and be filled and be filled and be filled and be filled, never stopping. Like be filled to infinity. Be filled with the Spirit. 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 Like, like you, can't just, you can't just drink one time. You know what happens if I take Ray out of the water? Like I read this. It's pretty sad. If I take Ray out of the water, it says when removing the water, he'll shrink back to his original size. Yes, he will. Ray will go backwards if we take him out of the water. He's going to get small if we take. And I just wonder how many Christians are going backwards because they hadn't been drinking in the water. Because what Paul said is don't be drunk with wine. Here's what he said. When you're not drinking living water, you'll get thirsty for other kinds of water. Are you with me? And, and this is not just for unbelievers. He's writing to the church. And I think sometimes this is what happens in people's lives and, and people that are following God. They're doing good and they're drinking, but they stop drinking. And when you stop drinking living water, thirst is constant. And if drinking isn't consistent, you're still going to have to deal with thirst. And before you know it, you'll be drunk with wine again when you are 
are supposed to be drinking of the living water. You'll be finding something else to drink of. Are you with me? Your thirst isn't going away. You, you know what else, what else about Ray? I was reading here because I was really excited to see him grow. You can do it, buddy. But then, but then I looked and it said, it said it may take several days. It may take up to, up to seven days for your creature to grow to 600% its original size. And that's why I realized if we're going to see all that Ray's going to be, he's got to stay in the water. And what I realized for, for us is if we're going to really see what God wants to do through our lives, we have to keep drinking. Be filled. Be filled. Be filled. Do you know your body is mostly water? Your body's 75% water. Your brain's 85% water. You're a bunch of slush heads. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but do you know this, that your body doesn't send proactive signals when it comes to hunger and thirst? In other words... Right now, you're either hungry or you're not, but you're not, your body's not telling your brain, hey, in two hours, you're going to need to eat. No. Now, in two hours, your stomach will start growling, and it will say, hey, you're hungry. And here's what, it, here's what science tells us, is that when your brain first logs the signal that your body is thirsty, you're already dehydrated. You're dehydrated because you haven't been drinking. But your body doesn't tell you when you're about to be dehydrated. It says, uh-oh, dehydration has stepped in. It's started. Like you're, 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 and, you know, and here's what I'm worried about is that sometimes believers don't know how to be proactive in their drinking. And we wait until we have a felt need to tell us, oh, I should have been drinking the living water. Like it's the morning after we see what we posted It's right after she said she was leaving. It's right after the kid is arrested. It's right after we lost the job. It's right after the diagnosis. And then we think, oh, 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 I, I got to find some living water. Now that's good. It's good to drink when you feel like you're thirsty. But what if you drank continually? Because you understood thirst was a constant. So drinking had to be consistent. Like, I've got to stay spiritually hydrated. I've got to stay in my life group. I've got to stay in God's word. I've got to stay in prayer. I, I, know, I know it's cold and rainy, and I'm really doing okay, so I could, I could just watch the live stream, but I need to be in the presence of God because I don't know what's going to happen this week. I know what I have planned, but I don't know what's going to happen. And most of the time when stuff happens, when, when, when the excrement hits the rotary device, we didn't see it coming. Are you with me? And so that's why we have to keep drinking because, because thirst is, is, is a constant. See, since water is our superpower, dehydration is our kryptonite. Because see, Jesus is talking of the Holy Spirit and he's saying, hey, if you dehydrate, you shrink back just like Ray. Like you dehydrate, you, you, so, so dehydration is your kryptonite and water is your superpower, that, that love of God, that flow flowing through. Here, here's the last thing. It says, thirst is continuous. It says, I wrote it. <laughs> I don't know why that was funny. Anyways, um, this is like I was quoting the Bible. I'm not quoting the Bible. I'm just reading something I wrote. This, um, I don't have it all together. It's okay. Thirst is continuous. So our going must be continual. Thirst is continuous, so our going must be continual. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. You want to guess the verb tense on the word go? Present, perfect, progressive. Just as Paul was saying, be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. Jesus said, go, 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 and keep going, go and keep going. 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 Go into all the world. Go into all the world. Where is all the world? Wherever there are thirsty people. How did Jesus know where to go? Same, thing, same way he knew in John chapter 4. He hung out at a well because that's where thirsty people hang out. If you hang around people long enough, you'll find out 
what they're thirsty for. Now, they think it's something else. Like, oh, if I, if I were just married, if I were just in a relationship, if I just had this job, if I could just get this degree, they, they'll think, they'll think. If I could just get noticed, if I could just get my big break, they'll think they're thirsty for a lot of things. But what we know, just like Jesus, is we know there's one water that really satisfies. And all you have to do is listen to people to figure out what they're thirsty for. And so here's what we do. We carry this, this river with us and we go out into the world. All we do is we go and we keep going. We're looking for thirsty people. Where are the thirsty people? Well, they're across the cul-de-sac. It's, it's, it's the neighbors that we have, right? You see them fighting in the front yard. Time to carry some water, right? It's the person in the office next to us. It may be the person down the street. It, it may be some cause or ministry. It may be the person that you run into. But here's what we know is that everybody is thirsty. The question is, have they figured out what they're thirsty for? And the best way to help them is to offer them a drink, just like Jesus. The one, I, let, me, let me tell you what you're really thirsty for. There's some living water that will actually satisfy your soul, that, that, will, actually, that will actually change something, that, that it will quench something. And you've, you've been trying all these. And so here's the thing. Because our thirst is constant, our drinking has to be consistent. But because their thirst is continual, our, then, then, then our 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 going has to be consistent and continual, right? Their thirst is continuous. Our going is continual. Are you, are, are, you, are you with me on this? And so what we're saying is we want to be a church, right? We want to be a church that doesn't just, nothing against going once a month. Or, I mean, once a year. I know there's a lot of churches that do a serve day, and that's fantastic. And, and I would love to do one of those. But I wanted something where we were going consistently and continuously, where we were going every month if we can. And I would love to get where we're going every week if we have that many teams of people. That there are plenty of needs, right? There's plenty of thirst. We're not going to run out of thirst and we're not going to run out of water. Jesus is just looking away for to get to two together. Are you with me? There's plenty of thirst and there's plenty of water. It's an endless supply of water. All we have to do is, is connect the two up. And that's why we're saying, hey, we're going to try to go start out once a month and, and take on needs and, and bring water and love and grace and mercy and power to the people around us. And, and I, this is why I love the church because guys, this is, this is what we're called to do. We're not called just to sit in, in what we used to call pews and other chairs. We're not just called to sit in the four walls and talk about the goodness of God. We're called to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, full of living water, to go out and let God's love and his rivers and his mercy flow through us to the people who are thirsty. God never said that the, the world would come to the church. He said, no, I want the church to go to the world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Tell them there is living water that will satisfy their soul. That's what, that's what we want to see. That's what we want to do. And that's what we're, we're launching. That's why I love the church. We're the only people called. We're the only people commanded, really, to carry water to a thirsty world. Carry water. I remember doing work in, in other countries. And we had the privilege one time to work with uh, Life Outreach, which is James and Betty Robinson. And, and we would go in and do the preliminary setup. And they would come in and drill a water well. Do you know, um, Jesus never went empty handed, right? I mean, one time he had a big crowd of people and they're all hungry. So Jesus literally created Long John Silver's right there. Like took five loaves, and, you know, two fish, and, you know, here's a value meal. Everybody can have some. And, and so Jesus didn't go empty handed and, and, and we don't want to go empty handed either, but water is so powerful. You can cure, um, Many of the diseases, about 80% of the diseases of the world with clean, you know, with clean drinking water, they would disappear. And so we would go in and we'd drill a well. You know what happened when we drill a well? Man, we could, we would, we could preach the gospel for days because people had clean water and they would come to the well to drink. And then we could say, hey, this will satisfy today, but we have something that satisfies forever. And that's what I want us to do. I want us to take that living water. We're not going to go empty handed. We'll find creative ways to reach people. We, 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 we'll do it in, in an incredible way. But here's the thing. I want people to experience living water. And I want us to carry it to them. And, and I want us, that's why I love the church. We're the only ones to offer that kind of hope. We're the only one to offer that kind of satisfaction. In a world of rolling stones where nobody can get no satisfaction 
we have what actually, come on somebody, we have what actually satisfies the soul. And we can't, we can't just sit in the four walls and say, that's church. No, that's half of it. The other half is going out there and taking the water that we drank of and letting it flow through us to a world that is thirsty. Amen. Can you give Jesus praise, somebody? Why don't you, why don't you stand?